11 pages of notes. So we 11 pages of notes. So we got a lot of material to cover. Big letters. It is big fun. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, uh, this is a special and blessed time of the year. It's your Passover, which you uh, ask your people to commemorate forever. And, and we just thank you for what you did back then and what you did through your son, Jesus. As we study this uh, holiday, this feast for Israel, Lord, help us uh, learn what it means for us today, what it foreshadows, what it's a type of. And, uh, let's not put our own human speculation on it or opinion. Let's see what your scripture says about it. Thank you for that word. We ask for your blessing. So when you start to just hand out the calendars, I brought way more than we need. I didn't know who was coming. These? Both, both copies. Uh, okay. One of each. Here, I'll flip one. See the colored ones? So all this is, you can stick it in your Bibles. Um, when I was teaching the Hebrew feasts, any one of you who is here probably got these, but it separates um, the religious holidays from the civil holidays in Israel. So as it relates to Passover, which the sun is down, it's starting right now. Um, I'll start off with a greeting for anyone online, for all of you tonight. Happy Passover in Hebrew is Pesach Samiach. So that means uh, happy Passover. And as you can see from the sheet that's in color, Passover in Hebrew is Pesach. It's observed in the Hebrew month of Nisan on the 14th, which for us is either March or April. And the passages that we'll look at tonight are listed there, Leviticus and Exodus. I've also listed the other holidays. It says I was teaching through the feasts and festivals. We needed this. And the reason they're all so pretty color-coded is the ones that are highlighted in green on the left are the three feasts where the men were required to pilgrimage to, to Jerusalem. And uh, the seven feasts in red, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, are the ones ordered by God in the scriptures. Um, the other ones are celebrated, but they weren't ordained. I, I shouldn't say ordained. They're not commanded by God to celebrate. The Jewish people picked, for instance, in the last one on Purim, to celebrate the Feast of Lots, which is commemorating the events in the Book of Esther. But there was no scripture that said, thou shalt celebrate the Feast of Purim. So that's why that's not in red. <clears throat> Other than that, I just put some pretty colors in there. Um, the one in the, the calendar in the black is the civil calendar. And if you follow it down, the seventh month in the first column of the civil year, which corresponds to the first month of the other calendar of the spiritual, the sacred year, is the month of Nisan, um, or Abib, as it was previously called. And the Jewish holidays, uh, Jewish months are on lunar cycles for all either 29 or 30 days. And they actually had people that were trained in observing when the new moon rose, when it waned, all the phases of the moon, and they would set the dates. And I, I told you a little comment on a little stuff, so just for your interest, well, so you know where we are. We're in the first holiday, in the seventh month of the civil year, in the first month, and the Passover in Hebrew is called Pesach. Um, what will soon follow after this, meaning tomorrow, for seven days is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Hag Hamatzad, which is celebrated. And again, in the colored calendar, I give you the dates, and it's celebrated for seven days. And uh, then that also, uh, inside that holiday, is the Festival of the First Fruits, or Reishi. Um, I'm not going to go into any of the details. You can listen to my festival 
discussion online, but the reason I put on lemon bread on my study sheets here to teach from is because you're going to see the removal of leaven intricately woven into the Passover celebration. So why don't you turn to me to Leviticus 23, 1 through 5. <clears throat> and uh, Joanna, would you read 1 through 5 for us? Um, Leviticus, Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. 23. What? Actually, 4 and 5, I'm sorry. Which one? I wrote 23. 1 through 5 in my notes. 19? Yeah, let's hold on until everyone gets there. Leviticus chapter 23. Yeah. Okay. It's the, it's These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, as the Lord's Passover. Keep going. Yeah, read the next one. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And then one more. Of our, uh, on the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. But you shall present food, present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. So you can see from the scriptures, the command is that the 14th day of the month at twilight or sundown begins Pesach or Passover. And then on the very next day, on the 15th day, you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread where you cannot have any leaven in your household or in your mouth for seven days. And on the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You have a celebration. And what you're doing is memorializing or commemorating the Passover of the Lord. Now, we get more detail from it in Exodus. So turn with me to Exodus, which is back above. We will read. Exodus chapter 12. Now this one's going to take some time. So Wendy, I'm going to have you read at least um, the first 13 verses. All right. The Lord said... Exodus 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. <coughs> You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat, in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roast it on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Another that remains until the, anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. <clears throat> For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The Lord shall be assigned, the blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So let's set the circumstance. The nine plagues have already happened. The final plague 
has already, the threat's already been put before Pharaoh. Moses and Aaron have gone to Pharaoh and said, thus saith the Lord, after midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt and I will strike down the firstborn in the land. Thus saith the Lord, I will go out in the land. Go be away. I don't want to say that standing. That doesn't preclude the fact he can send an angel to do his work. Okay. We were talking earlier who the destroyer was, whether it was Jesus, uh, pre incarnate Christ, or it was an angel of the Lord. I thought it was the angel of death. <laughs> or, or some versions say the destroyer, but for the purpose of this study, um, that's not really the highlight of it. Okay. Just wanted to note it. Just wanted to note it for the future Lord reference. In, the Lord is in control of who is sent. Right. <clears throat> So that is the background. And now the Lord speaks to Moses and Aaron and tells them about what's going to happen. So I want you to just take note before we continue on the elements involved. What's, what's the first thing we see? On the 10th month, you got to go find a lamb. The 10th of the month of Nisan. Okay? You're not starting this holiday till the 14th. So for four days... Your, you have this lamb, and obviously it, you can take it from the sheep or the goat, so they're calling a baby sheep a lamb or a goat, baby goat lamb. You keep it, it's unblemished, and at sundown you kill it on the 15th, and that's when Passover starts. Now what's another element? When I say element, I want to talk about nouns here, things that you see that are tangible. You take the blood, and what do you do with the blood? Put it on the door. The door post and the lintel. lintel. If anyone doesn't know what a lintel is, it's the piece of framework that supports above the doorway. It's the horizontal piece. And then you take the flesh, you roast it on the fire, and you eat it with two other elements. What are the two other elements? Bitter herbs. Bitter herbs. Unleavened bread. And and unleavened bread. bread. Okay, you don't eat it raw, you don't eat it boiled, you roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts, but none shall remain until uh, morning. Anything that remains, you need to burn in the fire. And the other elements are is how you're dressed. Your belt is fastened, your sandals are on your feet, your staff's in hand, you're ready to move ready to go. Eat it in haste. And I mean, that's with haste in mind. He's not talking about choking on your food. Mm -hmm. Something's about to happen. And what's about to happen at midnight? Um, not at midnight. That night, all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and in doing so, he's going to execute judgment as Dan has preached on the pantheon of the gods of Egypt. And anyone who has this blood on the doorpost and lintel will live. And the plague will not destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now notice it's about the land of Egypt. He doesn't say the people. And I want to just highlight that difference. Because if you're an Egyptian and you applied the blood over your doorpost, the firstborn would live. So remember wow. that. Lord is giving life to all those who apply the blood. Um, we tend to think of it as just a Jewish thing, but we do know that when the Jews left, many Egyptians left with them. So let's keep going, Wendy, and read 14, and I'll just tell you where to stop. All right. This day shall be for your memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from, the, from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days. But what, 
but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened leavened bread, for on this day, very day, I brought you hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month from the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the, from the congregation of Israel. Whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread. In that passage obviously begs the question, don't eat leaven. Should I eat leaven? No. But think about what it tells you here. It doesn't bring any new element then. Because remember back in verse 8, um, did I say it? Thank you. Yeah. You're eating the lamb, the unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. You've got three things you're partaking in. But what it tells you here, for the nation of Israel, Moses is reciting that the Lord is telling you to keep this as a memorial day, a feast to the Lord for generations, as a statute forever. He's not saying to do it for a year or two. He's not saying to do it for five years. He's saying never forget to do it. And he's really highlighting the leaven portion of here because it's moving right into the festival of Hamatzah, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is seven days. No leaven shall be eaten. No other food shall be prepared except that food you're going to have for your meals. And that leaven represents a few things. We know in Scripture that leaven represents sin. In this case, it foreshadows sin, but what it represents is the haste that they had to make. They didn't have time to let bread rise. They were booking out of there the next day, the next morning. So you gotta you gotta get your bread in the oven without yeast and you're gonna bake it and we'll partake of that soon. And it talks about some specifics about the assembly, that you shouldn't do any work. Um, so it gives you some rules and regulations, but it doesn't lay out, which is what I'm leading into, um, how the Jewish people all over the world celebrate it today. What's known as the Seder service. And I want to take a little bit of time, not a lot of the study, just to not go through the Seder with you, but explain to you what it is. But I want you to first understand what the Bible says, not what man has done. Now, we, got, we have some liberty in the scriptures because the Bible doesn't have to give you every detail. It tells you to commemorate this or memorial, memorialize it. So... That would mean to me, on am first reading, that every year I have to find a lamb, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs, and i got to get before the Lord in prayer. However, we're now in the year 2023, and roasting a lamb and sacrificing the lambs the way they were doing it here is not the easiest thing to partake in. And we're not making an exodus anymore. So I'm not here to condemn any of the rabbis who developed how a Seder service should look. They have their own trends. They have their own cultural ideas. And I just want to say is the command is to observe this rite as a statue for you and your sons forever. And when you come to the land the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. But it has changed over the years in its details. It's changed according to the culture and according to the land the Jews were living in. So bearing that in mind before we read, well, Wendy, why don't you read Exodus 12, 21 through 28. We'll be done with the section. Okay. And Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and select lands for yourself according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin 
and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of this house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptian, Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You should observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You will say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the land of Israel in Egypt, when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads in worship. And the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And just for your sake, Wendy, I take 23, literally, the Lord passed through or passed over yeah. to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel, yeah. he'll pass over and would not allow the destroyer. So I see the Lord passing over and giving light and sending a destroying angel. There are other people who disagree with me, and let's leave it at that. So... With this in mind, let's talk about the Seder, Wendy. Can you move the matzahs yes. off that? And let's put, or the cups. Let's just pass, let me get it. I'll pass around the Seder plate. Why don't I go around and I'll go around holding it just for. Yeah, but I want to just see if this one's the same. Yeah, I guess. Well, I'll pass around the Seder plate. Okay. So as Wendy passes around the Seder plate, I'll get back in front of the uh, camera here. You're going to see a place for an egg, bitter herbs, a shank bone, a rosef, horseradish, and parsley. Okay? Wendy, you want to pass this around? People can look at it. So some of this has been added since the Jewish leaders decided that roasting a lamb won't work anymore. <clears throat> and the actual experience, Wendy, I'm not going to be able to teach what you thought. I'll show it to you. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through it. <clears throat> so, what the rabbis did, for instance, on the Seder plate. Is substituted a roasted egg because the lamb is supposed to be roasted in verse 8 of chapter 12. So as because this happens in the spring, they view the egg as a symbol of something hatching in the spring, and they decided to put an egg and roast it on the plate. Now you can see clearly in the scripture, was an egg mentioned? No. Bitter herbs were mentioned, so with the liberty they decided to put more than one space for bitter herbs. Typically what we do, Mitch, you can confirm this, some places we'll put a bitter lettuce, parsley. We always put horseradish on the plate. That goes without saying. So one of them's filled with horseradish. But you can use that, that curly lettuce that's a little bitter. I forget the name of it. Chicory. Like that. And then you have the other elements, which are herosif and so forth. So let me just take you through, um, and I'll show you the books after. The book we use is called the Haggadah. So the, the Seder begins with the recitation of the uh, Kiddush, which proclaims the holiness of the holiday. It's a prayer. Now, it's said while reclining and holding a cup of uh, wine. And there's four cups you drink during this entire Seder. So you always lean to the left. Now, does anyone know why you lean? So your liver can drink? <laughs> so your liver can drink. <laughs> you lean because it was a sign of wealth. But I'll get into that a little bit more. So you open up with the prayer in Hebrew. Baruch atoy Adonai Eloheinu Malik Alam Barah which means, blessed are you, God, ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And that's how the, the Seder begins. Why are there four cups of wine? 
the rabbis have decided in their wisdom that they're connected with our liberation from slavery in Egypt. So they link them to the four great merits or praises that the children of Israel had in exile. And the four things we did that we're awful proud of, and the rabbis lead the way, is we did not change our Hebrew names while we were in slavery, kept our Hebrew names. We continued to speak our own language, Hebrew. We were very high moral people. We didn't engage in pagan activities. And we remained loyal to one another. Those four things are symbolized with the four cups of wine. Wine is also used because it symbolizes joy and happiness. But again, notice with the scripture we read in Exodus 12, is there any mention of wine? No. Seder means, in Hebrew, the word order. How do you say Seder in German? Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> um, Seder. So we lean on our left side, <clears throat> to accentuate the fact that we're free people. Now, I, I honestly don't know why it's on the left side versus the right. That's how but the liver drains. Maybe it is, Julia, I don't know. But I know that in ancient times, only free people had the luxury of reclining while eating. If you were a servant or a slave, you couldn't lay back and eat. You were always up on your feet, you are always serving, you are always doing something. So it's a symbol of being free. So what we do is what's called our earth shots. We wash our hands in a very ritually prescribed manner, as we would do before a meal. There's no blessing involved there. And then we begin with the carpus. Does it say carpus on that? When do you see carpus on the plate? No. 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 Some of the plates will say the word carpus, which is... No. Shaifa. And you'll put, it's a small piece of vegetable, sometimes um, in Orthodox Jewish tradition, they'll use a small potato or an onion, and it's dipped in salt water and eaten after you recite, but it could be a parsnip, it could be any small vegetables put on the plate, and you dip it in salt water, mm -hmm. have, have to wash your hands, and it's intended because this, this Seder service is really geared around the eldest child asking the question, Father, why is this night different than any other night? And then you recite and read the Haggadah. Everyone has a Haggadah usually at the table. For the little children who can't read, they listen. And what is the Haggadah? It's the story of the Exodus. They start in Abraham, and they take you right through the story to where we started moving into the promised land. Also, what's unique is the word karpas, read, it's, it's almost sounds superstitious, but when you read it backwards in Hebrew, it ref, it's referring to the labor that was performed by the 600,000 Jews living in Egypt. Because the, the, the last letter, which is samach, has the numerical equivalent of 60, representing 60 times 10,000, which is the amount of Jews living in Egypt, and the remaining three letters spelled Parak, which means hard work. And only a rabbi with nothing else to do can make this stuff up. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. But the bottom line is you start the service after the washing of the hands, the reclining, after the first cloud, cup of wine by dipping the vegetable in the salt water. Now, some people will tell you the salt water represents the tears that were shed while we were slaves in Egypt. The next thing that happens is the breaking of the matzah. So what you do is you pull out a bag that's usually a cloth bag called an ikad, and it has three pockets in it. So you take three matzahs, you put one in the top. So just picture a burlap bag the size of this paper, and it's got three pockets in it. On the top pocket, you put in the matzah. That matzah is never to be seen again during the meal, never to be eaten again. The middle matzah is put in to be used later. It's going to be broken. And the bottom matzah that's put in the third pouch is what you eat during the meal. Uh, the broken middle matzah, the bread, it's called the bread of poverty, remains visible 
as we tell the story of the accident. And the larger piece, depending when you break it, but whatever piece is larger, if it's fatal, break evenly, it's called the afakon. Um, why, why do they split it? Again, bear in mind, they're trying to attract the children to listen to the story. But the breaking of the matzah symbolizes the parting of the Red Sea. That's what they're trying to get them to start thinking. And now there's a tradition in many homes that we did, Wendy and I would do with our children, where once the middle matzah was broken, that's called the afakoman, you take the larger piece and you hide it. And then the children are sent out later in the meal to find it. Whoever finds it gets the gel or money. And in, depending on their age, you're giving them little gold chocolate pieces mm -hmm. that are wrapped in gold foil so they look like money, but they're really pieces of chocolate. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever did that. Um, we evolved to when our girls were older that I was getting silver dollars <laughs> and they got real money and rare coins at the same time. And then I got really crazy and I got those uh, Daenerys yeah. that I bought, ancient Roman coins that were worth a lot of money. So they, they really got excited about trying to find the Afrikan. But at this point, after it's broken and the Afrikan is hidden, now if there's any poorer people around, they're invited to join the Seder. Now what the mechanism of that looks like today, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. Back in the olden days, I don't know if they opened their door and they invited people from the streets or the homeless. But now the Seder tray has moved aside, the second cup of wine is poured, and the child asks the incredible time honored question, which is Ma Nishtana, Hala, Hazam, Makam, Halelo. Why is this night different from all other nights? Why are we eating only matzah? Why are we dipping the vegetables in salted water? What are the bitter herbs for? Why are we relaxing and reclining like we're kings? And this questioning from the eldest child triggers really all the significant elements of Passover, which is the highlight of the Seder ceremony, which is reading the Haggadah. So Wendy, if you'd be so kind to give me the fifth one. You mean the Haggadah? hardcover and give the the side of the table one just to peruse i'm not going to go through it like i said we're not having a seder tonight but this is what's recited and so you're not confused you read right to left in the hebrew it may confuse you but try to read it right to left. put the title in the front so you put the title in the front and it's the passover Haggadah. and and you know it opens up on the first page with a search for unleavened bread the mingling of the dishes, all these different, celery is a big one. Actually, the one we use to dip in the salt water um, is celery. Uh, we don't use potatoes or onions. But then you, it's pictorial and it's written in Hebrew, but it's why is this night different from other nights? And um, the question is then answered. And it's answered, answered in a series of stories highlighted by rabbis speaking to the sage son or the wise son, the wicked son, the naive son. And it goes through and it tells you everything to do. And it starts, um, formerly our ancestors were idol worshipers, but later the omnipresent brought us near to this service. And it talks about starting from Abraham and it goes through and you just, you go through the whole meal reading this. And it was one of the most exciting things in Hebrew holidays. And uh, anyone want to see this one? You know, this one I'll just put it over there if you want to look through it. So what is it talking about? It's talking about how Abraham rejected the idolatry that was in the land how he entered in a covenant with God. That's a description of suffering upon the people of Israel, slavery in Egypt. It takes you to the plagues. It takes you to the miracles that God did with the plagues. 
to redeem his people. And then the Seder service concludes with a prayer and thanking God for setting us free from Egypt, looking forward to the final redemption. And at that point in time, we finish the second cup of wine, the hands are washed again, and that's called the Araksa, and we simply take hold of the broken matzah, not the one we hid, it's still in the bag, and it's passed around and it's eaten. Um, and the idea, according to the rabbi's instructions as of today, is everyone has to have at least one ounce of wine. <laughs> so they're still jotting their, dotting their I's and crossing their T's. In other words, they're majoring on the minors. Because none of this, as we read in chapter 12 of Exodus or Leviticus, is in the scripture. And as you're eating the middle matzah, they're giving the matzah blessing, which is Baruch HaToyelo. Heinu melech halom ha-matzah, which means blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of all who brings forth bread from the earth. And then a further blessing, is that should happen anytime you're eating matzah. But on Passover, they say a second blessing, which is Baruch HaToy, Adonai, Aloheinu melech halom asher kiddushanu, the mitzvah talk, the Gitsanu, Al Akali, Blessed are you, Adonai our God, sovereign of all, who hallows us with mitzvah and his blessing, commending us, regard, commanding us regarding the evening. So this part's from the scripture, which is good news. They didn't lose it all, because we're supposed to eat unleavened bread. And then you take one ounce. Again, one ounce of the bitter herbs, whether it's endive, chicory, or the horseradish. And now you have on the plate, if you look at it, you have that thing called harosa. What is harosa? When you've made it, why don't you tell someone? It's sweet. It's uh, honey and apples and nuts, and you put a little bit of wine in it also. So it's a very it sweet mixture. It's actually pretty good. So you it's take the bitter good. herb. You dip it in the harosa. You give another blessing called El Akhilat Maror. But this time you sit up, you eat without reclining, because you're thinking about the bitterness of slavery with the bitter herbs. And the harosa is reminding you of the mortar that held together the bricks we made, the barrels. So again, this whole Seder is a reminder of slavery being under bondage, the history of Israel, and the release from that slavery. And you're supposed to keep an eye on God with all these blessings because he's the one who freed our people. And that is the purpose for the Jews. You know, so, and I don't mean to be coy about this at all because I know with some of you, and Mitch especially, have um, knowledge of Passover, but as Dan was talking to me last week, if you're in Beirut, Lebanon, and it's July 4th, you would have to explain the holiday because they don't celebrate in our neighborhood. It's July 4th. So we can't put our stamp on this holiday, holiday as Gentiles. This is a Jewish holiday, and I'm explaining to you how the Jews celebrate. So then after dipping the bitter herb in the harosa, you take that matzah, that piece from the middle that you can eat. Um, oh, not the middle matzah. That was the other way. You take the bottom matzah and you make a sandwich of the bitter herbs, the harosa. And again, you're going to have one ounce of meat. You have another blessing, and you eat this little matzo sandwich with bitter herbs and harosa. Uh, then you get the best part of the feast. You get to serve the holiday dinner. And actually, you didn't eat. Mm -hmm. So today they'll eat the hard boiled eggs because it'll be on the Seder plate. Now, in some circles, everyone will have their own Seder plate, but usually not. Usually, there'll be one ceremonial plate that's really a lot fancier. We used to have a crystal. Gorgeous. We moved it broke. 
So I just got that from Amazon to show you. And we put one roasted egg on it, and then over on the stove, there'd be roasted eggs for everybody. <laughs> but not everyone wouldn't have their own sitter. Um, so there's no way to eat lamb? Because well, you could roast a lamb, but what the egg, why the rabbis did it is they want to remind you, I think, that uh, the sacrificial lamb, the ceremony of it, is lacking. That we don't do that. So we're going to substitute for the lamb. Um, we do put a shank bone of a lamb on it to remind yeah. us. You know, that's called the zoroia. They don't have the shank on it. Oh, they do shank yeah, bone. Yeah, that's called the zoroia. And we put it on to remind us of what? It said in scripture to roast the lamb, mm -hmm. but we don't actually. But now that the meal's coming out, the meal could definitely be by the lamb. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but it, remember, it's not prepared the same way. You haven't killed a lamb and taken the blood and put it on your doorpost and lit them. You know, yeah. mom has put a, like a lamb with some nice carrots, carrots, carrots and carrots. herbs. And, potatoes. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably have zimus. Zimus. Brisket or lamb. Simmus is carrots, carrots and raisins. And raisins and honey, or, or in Wendy's world, it's maple syrup. <laughs> but it's in our house, it was maple syrup and raisins and carrots. Little baby carrots. So we'll have that. No, we'll have a brisket. Great. Of a brisket or a leg of lamb. Mm -hmm. Used to make brisket. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, couldn't the rabbi or a, or a rabbi follow through with the rest of the lamb and you take the consumer take the they could yeah. but I'm just saying I'm trying to show you today what's actually done in 21st century Passovers for Jews in America there's no lamb being sacrificed but you can certainly go to the store and buy a leg of lamb and eat it but you're not eating it off the Seder plate, that represents the lamb and the blood that was applied to the door. They're trying to substitute with this roasted egg. It doesn't quite cut it, and it certainly doesn't cut it scripturally. So you eat this meal. Um, there'll be, I'm trying to think what else is like a meal. There'll be meat or lamb, there'll be the zimis, the carrots, there'll be, oh, a kugel. Probably a luncheon kugel, which will have no yeast. So it's the Jewish version of lasagna, okay? It'll be egg noodles layered with cheese. If it's a dessert kugel, it'll have raisins and sugar in it. If it's served as a side dish, it might not have the sugar in it. And it's, it's my mother used to make it with farmer's cheese or cottage cheese. We used to do egg noodles with cottage cheese and a little sour cream. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was, that's still phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, the go-to side dish in, in, in my world is, while well, every you guys are all having mashed potatoes, I've got egg noodles with sour cream and cottage cheese. Now, in American Jewelry, if I can call it that, pot cheese is a big thing, which is cottage cheese drained of the liquid. So a cool day, the egg noodles would be made with the sour cream and pot cheese as well. That's where we make blint, how we make blintzes. Today, most Jewish people make blintzes with farmer's cheese which is similar. It's a cottage cheese that's finely pressed and all the liquid's drained out. But you go to the Crown Market in West Hartford, you can still get pot cheese by the container. Get it with a potato masher, make your blintzes, make your fugu. So after this meal's over, no matter what you have in it, you are back to reclining. Um, the kids are sent out, they find the afikoma, and they get the reward. <laughs> And the middle matzah of the apicom is supposed to go around the table and everyone take a piece of it and eat it. Then you drink the third cup of wine uh, and recite another blessing over the wine. And lastly, the fourth cup of wine, you fill the cup of Elijah. And everyone gets a cup okay, of wine. You have the door open to crack. Why not be able to let Elijah in at this time? Mm -hmm. And you actually recite the passage in Scripture inviting the prophet to come, which is the harbinger of the coming Messiah. So you are reciting the verse from Malachi that talks about the messenger who 
he sent it for the Messiah. Okay. And then you sing Hallel, you sing praises. Drink that fourth cup reclining, and uh, you're done with your Seder, except for one momentous prayer at the end. Any comments or questions? Sure. Um, when the child, the oldest child, asks the question, who is it, or is it a combination of everybody, all the adults uh, recite this story? <clears throat> no, the, the patriarch of the family. So, and how long does that take to recite through all that? Gosh, it takes hours. Three hours. Three hours. So you're three hours, and then you... Three hours through that service with the plate, and then you eat. I mean, we could speed you it up. It and Stephen was really good on speeding it up. I would skip over a lot of parts. I could do it in about an hour. But it should be three. It usually yeah. takes two to three hours to go through that whole book. It's a long process. And then you eat the meal. And then if you carried out the Seder service properly and your confidence has been received by God, you then say the most eternal blessing for the Jews is the Shana Abba Yerushalayim. And what that means is next year's Jerusalem. We're awaiting the return of our land. Mm -hmm. And that way you may hear this, that people make a layup in Jerusalem. Um, I've told many of you the story before where every Jew across the world is invited on the birthright that we can return up until, what is it, the age of 30? 27. 27. So they hit the young people. And we did it with Rebecca. She went to, our daughter, youngest daughter went there. And the whole purpose is to make Aaliyah claim her citizenship. If she can prove she has if a child under the age of 26 has one Jewish parent, grandparent too, or a grandparent, you can make a Leah, you can go to Jerusalem, paid for by them, expense paid, you get an armed guard, by the way, with you, with your little group. And you spend how much you spend a week there, 10 days, something like that. Mm, yeah, about 10 days, yeah. And because they want you to return to the homeland, claim your citizenship. Oh, and if you don't, which Rebecca didn't. They want you to grow up in America and send money back. To yeah. And to this day, I still get the big blue and white. Those are our colors. I still get the magazine. And it's predominantly um, about donating to uh, irrigation because water is a big thing in Israel. Mm -hmm. They're known throughout the world for the reclamation of water, for their salinization, for their deep wells. And, you know, they turned the desert into a green spot. So mm -hmm. most American Jews that are contributing are contributing to further scientific research and development of water. But it also goes to some, uh, spacing out the word, the, the villages where my cousin is. Oh, kibbutz. Um, kibbutz. kibbutz. Yeah. You know, you can help out a kibbutz, which is a, a commune, basically. Mm -hmm. So there's different ways to do it. but. That's the way you end the Seder service. And what you commemorated, let me just stress again, we're going to run over a little bit tonight, is you're commemorating what God did by releasing them from the bonds of slavery and allowing them to live. So the true meaning of Passover is to be found in the scriptures. I've just shown you how it's developed over the ages and what we do today. And I hope you note at the end of the study the difference between what is written in the scripture and what it means to what is practiced. Well, let me read you a few passages from scripture that are very brief. Because there's many Old Testament passages about God that I can demonstrate to you that God is the author of life, the author of creation, the king of the universe. Genesis 14, 19, and he blessed Abram saying, blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. Scripture testifies that he's creator of heaven. In Psalm 149, 2, it testifies that God is king. Let me read. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. In John 12, what Dan just preached about, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
What's the next line? Blessed is the king of Israel. And then Leviticus 17, 11, I want to tie in what's written in Exodus. For the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's sins. For the life of the creature, our life resides in our blood, right? It carries our oxygen. God says, I've given it to you for atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. So when that Passover lamb was slain and the blood was applied to the door, it's akin to the blood that's put on the mercy seat in the Old Testament. It's given in the, in the sacrifice on Yom Kippur once a year. It's given so that God can give us life. And he gave us life by passing over. Now, he did for a number of reasons, by his grace, by his love, but he also is a keeper of promises. In Genesis, Exodus 2, Genesis 15, he promised that Israel would be free citizens of the land in Canaan. He promised us the land. He can't carry out that promise if we're still slaves in Israel. So what he did, really in Egypt, was make an offer to the people of Israel. This is what happened when we read chapter 12. He's making an offer to the people in Israel and including the pagans that lived in Egypt to choose this day who you will serve. We know from the prophet Ezekiel, you just a cursory reading of chapter 20, knows that Israel is up to their eyeballs in sin. They were worshiping, many of them, the false gods of Egypt. So God's mercy and at the same time as justice is revealed in the Passover. He cannot, he will not ever ignore sin. So what did he do at the Passover? Offered relationship with the people through substitution. And he ultimately gifted salvation to the ones who accept him as king. He asked them to turn from the pagan gods and the pagan king the God of this world who's behind us, what we taught last week, Satan, and turn to the living God who is king and creator of the universe. He used his power, as Dan has preached on in previous weeks, to de demonstrate not just his superiority, but the reality of who he was over the whole pantheon of the pagan gods. All those false gods, the Egyptians, and some of the Jews were worshiping. He made them look like what they were, nothing. <clears throat> he revealed himself in a very powerful way. And why did he reveal himself like this? Because of who he was? He wanted the Israelites to renew the passion they once had for him. He wanted the ones who have turned their backs on him to turn their backs back towards him, what's known as repentance. He wanted the ones who had fallen away to come back, and he wanted the ones who had no faith get faith, get a multitude of reasons, but he was giving life if they would turn and serve him as king. The traditional explanation that's done through the Seder doesn't do Passover for either Jew or Christian really justice. We have to look for, it doesn't do it biblical justice, because we have to look for the scriptures. Passover is not simply a celebration from the release of slavery from the Jews. And it shouldn't be an event ignored by Christians, Gentile Christians. At least not ignored, I'm not asking you to celebrate it, but at least understand it as a foreshadow of the life we now have in Christ. But Passover is the story of how God offered to the people himself as king, both Israel and Asia. How he promised to give them life, not just physical life, by passing over their houses, but an eternal freedom and an eternal life that can only become by serving him, by first acknowledging him as king and Lord, and then serving him. Why would you put the blood on the door and the lintels if you didn't believe he was God? If you weren't turning your back on all the sinful pagan ways, you wouldn't do it. Because if you did it insincerely and said, 
hey, I think I'll get away with this. I'll kill a lamb and throw some blood on it. You know, we already know the Bible passage. God can see the heart. He wouldn't accept that anyway. So you're, you're, you're saying that I'm going to serve him as king instead of the king of this world. And now I want you to understand that's why Jesus is the Passover lamb. So you become a citizen of his kingdom. Because we tend to confuse salvation and the atonement that Jesus made with this passing over and giving us life. But I'll, I say this and hear it real slowly and clearly. Once you become a citizen of his kingdom, then you have life eternal. And you're promised that abundant life as long as you walk with God. But first you have to have the relationships. And the only way you can do the relationship is turn to him as king. So I see the foreshadowing by all means as we read the scripture. You see Israel in bondage to sin. You see that all humanity is in bondage to sin. Romans tells us that. Second Peter tells us that. Israel spared from death by the blood on the door and the lintel. And we're freed from eternal death by the blood of Jesus. Like John said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As Israel embarked on a new life of freedom, even though it took them 40 years to get to the promised land, what are we free from with God as our king? A life of sin, death. The wages of sin is death. We have a new way of life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we're new creations in Christ. So there's a lot of foreshadowing in the Passover. But we don't need to bring friends of Israel or Jews for Jesus and see every element of the Seder plate and start explaining in a way saying that, that represents Jesus, that represents Jesus, that represents Jesus. The main thrust of the scripture and this whole Passover celebration is that when you chose to put the blood on the door, you chose to acknowledge God as your creator, as your king, as your Lord and your savior. And guess what the greatest benefit of that is for, for us? Salvation. We get to live forever with him. So the priest that one had to go in that Holy of Holies once a year and make atonement for the sins of Israel, that's a foreshadowing of the greater thing that happened that the writer of Hebrews talks about when Jesus went to the cross and made atonement once and for all, it says in the scripture. He didn't have to do it year after year after year after year. But before that atonement happens, before the cross happens, you get the offer of life from God. And you get that offer of life from serving God. Him is the one true king. Now turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And now I'll tie it into Jesus. We'll see where we end in today. First Corinthians chapter 5. In 7 and 8. Well, after he says, Do you know, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole um, cleanse the leavens? I'll read seven. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are a leaven. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The slaying of the Passover lamb, where we get the blood to put on the door and the lentils, is a type, a foreshadow, a picture of the death of the Lord Jesus, which gave by grace to all who accept the gift eternal life under the kingship of God. And Hebrews 10.10 10 says, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Christ once for all. <clears throat> so as I keep stressing that as they applied the blood on the door and the lintels, they were choosing to serve God serve Yahweh instead of the pagan gods. That's with our commitment to him in that way, 
by his grace, he offered, he still offers the gift of eternal life. By those who apply the blood, because that's what we're doing. We're applying the blood. So now turn with me to Matthew 26. We'll come for a circle. When do you be my reader again? If you would please, 17 to 29. By the way, I'm on my last day, so I'm almost done. I did have big fun. Sorry, Stephen, what chapter? Matthew 26, 17 through 29. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, to give it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So the, the evidence is real simple. Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples. He was eating, dipping the celery in the water with one of his disciples. He was having a Seder. Now, I submit to you that it probably did not look at the one, like the one I just described with this fancy plate with depressed holes in it so you could put all this stuff around. But you can rest assured he had the elements of the lamb or the goat. He had the bitter herbs and he had the unleavened bread. But what does he do with the Passover? While they were eating, he gave thanks. He took the matzah. He gave it to his disciples and took it and said, this is my body. He took that matzah out of the third pouch. Then he took the cup of wine, probably the cup of blessing at the end, looking forward to when Elijah's coming. And when he said, give thanks, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out many for the forgiveness of sin. What is the Passover ordinance say in chapter 12 of Exodus? A lamb must be slain. It must be killed so you can get the blood to put on the door of the lintels. Jesus is saying here that his blood, well, his body, first of all, is the sacrifice. And with the sacrifice of his body comes the blood that is poured out from you and you are saved. So I want you to understand what he's done here. He's taken the celebration of Passover and turned it into what we named it the Lord's Supper. He didn't name it the Lord's Supper. He was celebrating Passover, but he gave a new meaning to it. He's saying, no longer will you have to go out and kill a lamb and apply him to the door, because I will become the lamb for you. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's not supernaturally making blood poof like a genie in a bottle. He's giving up his body. So he's become the lamb that was slain. And the blood that poured out of his side on the cross is the blood that's upon us. 
He didn't come his final time to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. He came to become Passover. Our Passover. This is time God didn't ask us as Christians. He didn't ask the disciples. He didn't ask anyone in the room. Hey, who's got a lamb? Who's got a lamb to kill? We need some blood. Jesus was the lamb. God provided his own. He was the Passover lamb in all ways. The prophecies and the scriptures show you. What did they need? They needed a mature male, unblemished. Go to Luke 3.23. Jesus is described as the mature male. No broken bones. Exodus 12, John 19. Jesus had no broken bones. Remember, they didn't break his bones on the cross, right? Spirit, Spirit, but they didn't break any bones. No bones would be broken. Prophesied in the scriptures. You had to have an unblemished lamb. First Peter 2 says he was examined and found faultless. He had to be slain for our sins. That was the lamb in Exodus. Lied for the door. Lied through the door to cover us. But yet it says in the scripture that we're redeemed by no perishable things. Old or silver can't buy us back, but only the precious blood, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 or 19, tell us that Jesus, Peter tells us, inspired by God, that Jesus is that of blemish. So when you think about it, just as the blood at Passover for the Jews applied to the door, Cause the destroying angel to pass over each household. I'm smiling at Wendy because she's a princess, Jesus. Christ's blood causes God's judgment to pass over sinners and give us new life. But understand, it's the offer of the kingdom. It's the offer of the kingdom. That's what it is. It was prophesied in Jeremiah 31. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And that's exactly what happens when you say yes to the kingship of Jesus in your life. And when you do that by grace through faith, saved. Because how did that new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied, 100 years that I just quoted in Jeremiah 31, 33, how did that come to fruition? It only came to fruition by Jesus offering the kingdom. And that's just what was done on Passover. They were offering the kingdom of God to the people of Israel. So let's just walk through the process in closing. Because it's a simple process. It's outlined in the Bible. Repent of your sinful condition. Recognize the need for God. Who is the king. Recognize the wonderful benefit of walking as a citizen. As a king. You're going to live eternally with him. When you serve him, your joy will be full. You'll have life, and he says you'll have it more abundantly. You'll be made holy as he is holy. The fruit of the Spirit will dwell within you and it will work outwardly as you serve him and serve other people. So what the Passover represents, when you choose the one true God as king, it not only results in your salvation, but it places you in his kingdom as a citizen so that you can walk with him day by day, moment by moment. And understand this kingdom mentality. I keep emphasizing. I must have said the word king tonight 200 times because it's so important. Because when, when you quote the verse, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, you're only, what you're doing is you're recognizing him as king of your life. And you're saying no to the king of this world. And he tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, the apostle Paul tells us, Whenever you eat this bread 
and drink this cup and proclaim the Lord's death. So his Passover was supposed to be memorialized and commemorated forever by the Jewish people. To the Christian, to us in this room now, we need to remember and commemorate the Lord's death by celebrating communion until he returns. And when we're celebrating communion, we're celebrating the fact that we are all citizens in his kingdom. And yes, because of that, he's offered us the free gift of salvation by his grace. And we come to him, and through our faith, we've opened up that gift of salvation, accepted it, appropriated it, and the atonement has made, been made for us in a real way. And it'll become even more clearer when he returns, or when we meet him in the air, or when we're in heaven. When I say more clearer, we'll understand all the mystery. So that's why I didn't do a Seder tonight. Because the Seder is just, Seder is just going to explain, explain July 4th to the Lebanese people. You'll see what the Jews in America did. Okay, you'll have another history lesson. <clears throat> I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the Seder, if it's understood properly. But for the Christian today, we have to understand that Jesus is our Passover lamb. And by his body, Gave us the blood that makes atonement for our souls. And we have communion. <clears throat> we have communion now. And that's how we'll close. So before we do it, when do you start passing out communion? Yeah, I'm going to go wash my hands. Um, anyone have any questions on Lorraine? I'm always, whenever you read this account of the Last Supper, I'm always amazed at how <clears throat> um casual it was. You know, he, Jesus told them what was going to happen, but there was never any response from the disciples, other than am I the one that's going to betray you? But they never, I never, I felt like they just were sitting there, oh yeah, like they really weren't listening. To yeah, me. the account is very short. Um, remember, not everything that happened is written, so this thing took a lot more time than 12 verses. And a lot more probably occurred. I think what Jesus inspired Matthew to write down is what he wanted us to know. That the other stuff is not as consequential. Did someone say to Jesus, why is this night different than any other night? Did they go through a formal Seder? I don't think so. I think what Jesus was trying to get at here is um, from now on, the Passover is going to mean something different to you. Because I am the body, I am the lamb. You don't need to go cook a lamb and roast it and do all that stuff. I'm the lamb, done once for all for you. And from now, you don't need to put the blood on the door anymore either. So, so he took. So you don't. You, if you believe in in Jesus, you really don't need to do the Passover supper anymore. No. It's just a tradition that you do because yeah. that's how you grew up. But actually, it should have ceased. For, for any Bible-believing Jew, a member of the remnant, who understands that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, there's no need whatsoever to celebrate Passover other than to teach your children um, history. And also, there is another highlight that I think is very important. Teach them what I taught tonight, what Passover symbolizes for the Christian. It symbolizes serving a new king. So there's certainly no harm in it. I just don't think it's required anymore. But truthfully, to teach this part where Jesus said, um, drink of all you, for this is the blood of my covenant. And he tells you that I am now the Passover lamb. I don't think you can teach that and do it justice without doing the Passover story. Because, story yes. yeah, I mean, I just like I did tonight. Yes. If I didn't take you through Exodus, and show you what the true Passover is, how could you understand when Jesus says, I'm the Passover lamb? You're going to go, how are you a Passover lamb? You don't look like a lamb. But his body had to be sacrificed. And now, when John sees him in the water in Jordan, it makes sense to you, I hope. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's the lamb of God that was slain, the Passover lamb, when the blood was applied to the door. 
So I, I think in a great way, it makes sense as Jews to still do the Passover dinner as long as you get to Matthew 26. I think doing without Matthew 26, you do it injustice. I would not want to teach my girls. If, I, I don't want to do it the same way. I taught them the Passover and other traditions. We did a modern Seder. But I didn't do it Friends of Israel or Jews for Jesus. I didn't go around the Seder plate and say everything represents Jesus. We went to the Matthew 26, and I said, we're not commanded to do this. We do this as a lesson to understand that now our Passover lamb is Jesus. It's his blood that saves us, not the blood on the door. But it's a great picture for young Jewish children. I think it's a great picture for Christian children because it shows us the release from slavery and the bondage from sin. Yeah, um, I just wanted to mention that um, as I was reading, 1 Corinthians um, 11, 17. 17. That's another way that, there, uh, that the Lord's Supper is explained in that a little bit more um, than it was in the one that we just read. Right. This is my body, which was for me. Do this in remembrance. Of Go down to. Um, this is the cup. For as often as you eat. 28. However, in an unworthy manner, let a person examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And then it goes down to for anyone who eats or drinks um, without discerning the bad, judge, you place judgment on yourself. Yeah, because or, it's, it's about repentance. You have yeah, to and be it's clean. all, it goes into it a little. Many of you will become weak and ill um, if you do this in remembrance of me. Well, that would be without like. Without examining your own. Right. You know, in other words, repenting of your sins again before you. Right. And before I submit you to you that. The, the, the meal. And I submit to you that the Jewish story in Exodus is an example of sincerity. You have to be sincere. And God looks at your heart and says, are you applying the blood just because you heard the rumor? I'm going to kill the firstborn, or do you really want to serve me? And that's no different than when we do the communion, as we're about to do now. We can't come and partake with our king unless we're clean before. Exactly, and that's what I was saying, that um, it, it's not just a casual thing to no. receive the Lord, not like we all. do every, you know, uh, first of the month, and um, it, it's not casual, and it shouldn't be be um, presented as casual. It's it's a very serious um, yeah. and, um, and spiritual and we, thing. And we have some real Western misconceptions about serving a king. We think of the medieval kings and how mean they were. And this is a king who loves us, is gracious to us, mm -hmm. and calls That's us right. like any other king to obey his commandments mm -hmm. and to have a relationship with him. And he's promised to bring us inside the walls of his castle and protect us and guide us and give us joy and do a lot of other things he's promised for us. And it is serious. It is serious. So when we take communion, as we're about now, we're going to have to take a moment, confess our sins, um, and just get clean before him so that we enter once again into that relationship with our king, who is the Passover lamb. So that being said, anyone else have any more comments before we partake? And if you don't feel right partaking, don't do it. Because it is a serious matter. But if you are ready, let's do it. So what did you do? Break up? Alicia? One matzah and then pour it down. You gave us a good slice, thank you. Well, you know, yeah. it's not a meal. Huh? I don't want it this big. No, it's bigger. No, it's bigger. <laughs> it's bigger. Is there any chopped liver? Oh. Well, that would be nice. All right. So let's everyone take a mouse off the plate who wants to partake, and then we'll, uh, we'll spend a moment. And I think it's a good idea. You know, Lorraine brought up a good point. There's a lot unsaid, but try to picture that room where Jesus is doing this right now. The mouse has been passed. Now, it's probably unleavened bread. That's probably not what we call stitched cardboard. They probably ripped a piece off. I had some before we came. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
good with hummus, it's good with butter, it's good with cream cheese, it's good with chopped liver, <laughs> matzo fry, you name it. All right, let's go before the Lord and pray and just ask that we get right with him. Um, hey, Dan, you want any? Good. Father, we just uh, come before. Let us take the matzah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's do this in remembrance of him. He died for us. Give us his body. And as we prepare to take the cup of the new covenant, Jesus said, this is my blood, which was shed for you. This is the blood that was applied to the door and the lintels. Symbolically, in anticipation of the blood that was shed on the cross for our sins. God literally has passed over us and given us life. He's redeemed us. When God said these people need to get what's coming to them, death, the wages of sin is death, Jesus stood up in that heavenly courtroom and said, I'll give up my body, which we just celebrated, and I'll give my blood, and I'll pay the price with my body and my blood. So that's why we celebrate communion, because he's given us life. We chose to serve in a new king. So drink with me in remembrance of that. Amen? Amen. So, uh, are there any questions or further comments you want to ask about? If you want to take home a Haggadah and look through it, be my guest, and return to me at church. Um, if you want a copy of my notes, I can email them to you too. So. Go ahead and ask him for that. I think I took down all the passages. Well, let's close with prayer. Father, thank, thank you for this uh, night, this very special night. When you said, my people free. Let us take the words of Jesus and just meditate on the fact that our lamb that was slain. Lamb of God who takes the sin away. King of Israel, the king of creation. Author of the life and the God of the universe. We give you thanks in all things. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Steve. Thank you. You're welcome.